Hello, welcome to We Need to Talk with Chris Godinas. Uh, this video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up and it will have therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. So, that being said, I need to let y'all know that the, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. This discussion is going to be about sexual abuse. We are going to talk about how sex is used as a weapon, how the lack of sex is used as a weapon, uh, incest and other sexual issues regarding um, uh, malignant abusers. Okay, so I just wanted to let you guys know it's going to be a trigger warning. So just to let you know. So if it gets too intense, feel free to go do something else, come back to it, do whatever you need to do, take care of yourselves. All right, so sexual abuse in a domestic violence situation, which is more common than people really realize. So sex is used as a weapon in domestic violence in a lot of different ways. So in the initial love bombing phase, they will present, the abuser will present themselves as this incredibly sexual being because that's what they think you want. And so they'll be all over you. They'll be like, oh, I love sex, I love sex, I love sex, I love sex. Oh, let's, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And so especially if they know that you have been in a previously abusive relationship where the sex was like gone, they will present themselves as the polar opposite of whatever it is that you just had. Um, so, hey guys, good morning, good afternoon, good, good morning, good afternoon. Um, uh, so they will present themselves as the polar opposite of whatever it was that you had prior. So. What I'm trying to say is, is if you've been in an abusive relationship um, and you've told your new abuser everything that went on in that relationship, initially they will present as the polar opposite of that. But then they will um, they will start presenting the way they really truly are. Thank you, Thyra. That was very sweet of you. Um, hello, guys. Um, okay, so what they will do in the love bombing phase is that they will mine you for information and they will find out what your sexual preferences are and they will become that in the beginning. Eventually, once, once they have got their hooks into you and they now know that they have you, the sex is gonna dry up. It, it might take a little bit of time, but the sex absolutely will dry up and they will use it as a weapon. And it, it, it men and female, male and female abusers use it differently. So um, it's usually what I have seen is that the, the, empath and the the normal person and the abuser will get together initially it's intense it's fireworks they're with each other every moment of every day etc 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 the sex is amazing blah 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 and then they get their hooks in them they move in together they get married they do whatever and suddenly it dries up like poof overnight gone and they then use the sex as a tool like anything else. Remember, they don't see anybody, anything as anything other than something to be used. So sex is just another tool for them. Do, do what they want and they'll have sex with you. Don't do what they want and they will give you the cold shoulder. So that is one way that they do that. Um, I met my ex when I was 18 and saving my virginity for marriage. I had recently been broken up with by my high school boyfriend. Yeah, that's that's what they do. And oh man, and they force people to go against their natural moral compass. So the other thing that I have seen abusers do, both male and female, is that they will talk their partner into doing things that they would not otherwise do. So for example, remember, the more malignant they are, the more dark triad they are, the more they do this kind of thing. So you have traits of down here, and then you start sliding into malignancy when you start harming people. When you get to the dark triad end of it, you're talking about narco, nar <laughs> narcopath. Yes, that's, that is it, but nar narcissist. <laughs> My brain is gone. Narcissist. Machiavellian and psychopath. So narcopath, yes. So it's narcissist, Machiavellian and psychopath. So what that is, is they've got the narcissism going. They're control freaks. They want to control and they've got the psychotic thinking, which is no bueno. So what they will do is they will convince their partner to do things that they would not otherwise do. But what they're doing is they're trying to get blackmail material on you. That's what they do. So what I have seen abusers do, both male and female, is convince their partners to do something like an orgy, a threesome, which, you know, hey, if that's your thing, no big deal. But if you're videotaping it and you're using it against that person, A, that's illegal, and B, they're using it for blackmail. 
and they're using it so that they can then smear you later on with the family and the friends. So they will take stuff from your past or they will take stuff that they've convinced you to do that you would not otherwise do and then use it against you for the discard, if that makes any sort of sense. Um, uh, I did save myself from marriage and he was on board with that. The abuse didn't start in earnest until we were actually married. Yeah, because they wait until they get their hooks into you. That's for darn sure. So, um, so what I have seen them do is they will literally talk their partner into filming sex acts and even, even sex acts with them. But then they think in their little twisted brain that they can then use that against the target at a later date. And I've seen them try that. I've seen them trying to show family and friends, well, look, look what, she, look what she or he did. Look how perverted they are. Look at this, look at that, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, first of all, that's illegal. And second of all, it goes on in the bedroom, stays in the bedroom. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and um, but they think that that's a way to uh, manipulate through shame, okay? So because, so many things going on with this. Oh my God. So because our society is so weird about sex, really, when you think about it, um, it's a really, it's a tool that abusers use with some certainty to inflict shame on the target of abuse, thinking that they can manipulate them, you know, because sex in this country for some reason is not talked about and it should be. And it's, kind of a shameful thing you know it's it's like oh no we can't talk oh my goodness you know we're, we're worse than the damn british swear to god no offense britain but seriously it's like this whole thing of like oh we can't talk about it we can't talk about it it doesn't exist we can't talk about it well here's what happens when you don't talk about it you get kids that don't understand how the process works and you get kids that are giving blowjobs in the back of buses at age 11 because they don't understand so yeah you got to talk about it so sorry sidetrack okay so they will use sex as a weapon to blackmail. That is one of the things that they do. And they will try to get people to go against their moral compass. So I have literally seen cases where, you know, we've had to get police involved. We've had to get attorneys involved. We've had to, because this person was trying to, um, what's that website where they, um, they shame people? Oh God. It's, it's where they try to shame people with, stuff that they'd done and I can't think of it. But anyway, eh. so there's a whole, there was a whole in the past, there was a whole website where abusers would go and post stuff online trying to shame their victim and trying to manipulate their victim and trying to control their victim. So yeah, this is what abusers do. And of course, when you're in the love bombing phase, you're so in the fog at that point and you want to please them so badly that you're willing to tape things you're willing to do things that you would not otherwise do so i've actually had one abuser demand that his spouse participate in an orgy or you know multiple partners and she didn't want to do it she absolutely didn't want to do it and so he did the whole you're a prude i'm going to divorce you blah 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 so she went ahead and did it Fast forward a few years, he's then using it against her in the divorce case, trying to get custody of the kids. So this is what these assholes do. So you've got to be aware and awake. If you're going against what you are comfortable with, and if your partner does not respect you enough to, to understand the word no and respect that, then Houston, you got a problem. You know, you shouldn't be forced into sex acts that you do not want to do. If you're not interested in it, don't do it. If you think it's going to be painful, don't do it. If it's something that goes against your moral fiber, don't fucking do it. If you're okay with it, then do it. Pretty simple. But a partner should not be sitting there forcing, pushing, 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 pushing. And that brings me to my next topic. So someone was asking me about um, what about in relationships when they use, you know, it, well, we're married and they want sex, but you don't. But they, they want sex like unnaturally all the time. So here's the thing, guys. Normal, natural sex life is individualized. I can't, when people come to me and go, well, what's a normal sex life? Uh, it depends on the individuals. It depends on the individuals. Some people are comfortable having sex every day and that's okay. Other people, it's, you know, three times a week, two times a week, one time a week. When you start getting less than that, then I'm suspecting there's something going on on, especially if you're healthy and you're in the normal age range. Even when you're geriatric, you should still have a sexual desire. So um, yeah, so there's there's that. So, um, but if somebody is like on you all the time and you're not wanting the sex and they're forcing you to have sex, that's called rape. That is called rape, plain and simple. I don't care if you're married or not. If you say no and they push it and they do it against your will, that's abuse, that is domestic violence, that is rape, period. So um, 
what happens though is is that the abuser will say, well, we're married and I can I can do whatever I want because we're married and blah 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 blah. And it's like no, 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 no. Normal rules of social engagement still apply. Sorry. So uh, my husband, John, actually gave me a great example of this. He's like, it's like offering someone tea. <laughs> if you offer them tea and they say no, you don't force the tea on them. If you offer someone tea and they are unconscious, you do not force the tea on them. If they do offer someone tea and they first say yes to it, but then change their mind and say no, you do not force the tea on them. Same thing, really no difference. So, um, so there is that. So what other ways that I have seen sex used in an abusive relationship is that they will withhold sex. So they, they either force sex on the person, force sexual acts that the person does not want to do, tapes it, you know, tries to use it to shame, humiliate, control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or they withhold, 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 but then blame the partner. So what they'll do is they'll withhold sex and say it's all the partner's fault. Well, I don't find you attractive. Well, I don't da 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 da. Well, I did. You're fat. You're ugly. You're this. You're, you 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 guns. So they're hitting you with the you 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 guns. It's all your fault that I'm not sexually attracted to you. Whoa! Put on the brakes. Er, stop. So wait a minute, let me get this straight. So during the love bombing phase, y'all couldn't keep your hands off of them, but now suddenly you're married or you're living together and they're fat and ugly and you can't stand them? Huh? Really? Yeah, uh-uh, I'm calling bullshit. I'm, call I'm calling bullshit. So um, that's another thing that they do is that they control through lack of sex as well. They will, it's a way to devalue the partner basically because really when you think about it, <sighs> When we are with somebody romantically, it gives us that rush. It gives us that, oh my God, this feels wonderful. And I'm with somebody and they find me attractive and I find them attractive and the sex is wonderful and this is great and we're complimenting each other and it's lovely. In a healthy, normal relationship, yes, you do get a little bit of that infatuation in the beginning, but it levels out. It's not like this bomb kind of thing. It's not like this constant kind of thing. In an unhealthy relationship, it is nonstop, nonstop, nonstop until they get their hooks into you, and then it drives up. It absolutely drives up. It's, it's, like, it's like the ring goes on the finger or the person moves in and a switch gets toggled and they change completely. And so what they will then do, like I said, is that they will then start the devalue phase. And this is why it is so insanely harmful and hurtful to the other person because we got with this person thinking that they got us, that they understood us, that they liked us, that we were compati compatible and, and simpatico and you know everything was cool and great and groovy and that they got us sexually and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because sexuality is a part of our identity as well. It's like, we're not just this one, you know, one dimensional creature. We've got all of these different aspects of ourselves. So when an abuser goes after us sexually and starts devaluing us and starts harming us and starts hurting us and starts putting us down, that is so incredibly damaged and especially damaging, especially if we have got original wounds going on and we're dealing with self-esteem issues, which is generally the case when we get involved with an abuser. Hang on, somebody just wrote something. Uh, my ex was like that. She was a self-confessed borderline dominatrix, extremely pushy, trying to force me into all sorts. Then I dated narcissist full on in the love bombing phase, then withdrawal to punish. Yeah. That's exactly what they do. And it's it's frustrating and it's it's confusing as all hell because it's like, how could they go from, oh my God, you're you're a god or a goddess, and to you're fat, you're ugly, I hate you, I can't stand you, you're you're repulsive, you're gay. That's another thing that they do. O M G. So because they're having problems with sex and sexual desire they will accuse the partner of having some sort of sexual issue, which gayness is not a sexual issue, but like, let's say it's a heterosexual relationship and it's, it's domestically violent. The abuser will then accuse the, the target of being gay. If the abuser is the one that's having a hard time enjoying sex, I'm sorry, what, Wh who, what, how, when did that happen? Hello? Yeah, that's what they do. They never take responsible for their own stuff. It is, crazy go nuts. It is absolutely crazy go nuts. The whole point is that if you are aware of those things, you won't find yourself in these kinds of situations. Yes, but no, it, it, no Noah, Noah, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, you got to get to the awareness. And the problem of it is, is when you're in the middle of the abuse, when you're not working on the original wound, you're in the fog. 
you're in the fog. You're absolutely in the fog. And you will continue to be in the fog until the original wound gets handled. Because what we tend to do is, is that we tend to draw to us people who are like our parents, especially the one that we had the most difficulty with. And we keep getting involved with similar types, thinking that we're going to heal that wound. If I can just make this other person love me, then I will make mom or dad wrong. Doesn't work that way, guys. Doesn't work that way. All we do is we keep compounding, keep compounding, keep compounding, keep compounding, keep compounding, keep compounding. So what you've got to do is you've got to work on the original wound, and that way you will get out of those situations. Um, yeah. So, um, okay. So, all right. Where was I? Brain gone. Choo-choo chain. Left the tracks. Where did I go? Okay. So they will accuse you huh, again, projection of the very thing that is either going on with them, because oftentimes what you will find in abusers is they've got a very odd idea of sex. They either have some sort of religious nut thing going on where it's like sex is a dirty act. Um, they'll have this, um, especially with the male narcissist, you'll see the, um, you'll see the, uh, virgin whore thing. So you're either this virginal goddess on this pedestal that's perfect or you're this slut whore. It's this really dichotomized, very sick way of thinking of sex. And um, and they make people wrong for being sexual. That's the other thing. So so let's say, you know, at first they're like sex, 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 but then you continue on going, hey, yeah, let's go do sex. Well, they'll start accusing you of being a slut, a whore, uh, 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 um, nymphomaniac, you know, things like that. And it's like, wait a minute, what? We were, what? Hello. Um, my BPD ex suffered from erectile dysfunction. I suspect it was from a combination of diabetes and drug and alcohol abuse. Um, yeah, diabetes can cause erectile dysfunction, but here's the thing. If somebody has erectile dysfunction, the abusers will use it against them. And the abusers have been known to go public and tell anybody and everybody that will listen that that's the problem. So for example, somebody has got a sexual issue, sexual dysfunction, either male or female, either the male, the male cannot get erect or the female cannot reach orgasm, right? What the abusers will do is they will go out into public and tell anybody who will listen. I mean, waiters, total strangers, grocery clerks, anybody, yeah, this person can't, you know, they're frigid, they can't blah, 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 or this person can't blah, blah, blah. You know, it's really, it's, it, you never mention it. It's like, here's the thing. If somebody's having a sexual issue, you go to your doc, you go to your doc, you figure out if there is a physical issue going on. If there's no physical issue going on, then that means there's a mental health issue going on and you work on it that way. You do not go running out into the street and tell anybody who will listen that this person has got some sort of sexual dysfunction. That's abusive. So um, let's see. So that is that is that. I mean, it's like if there is an issue going on, you fix it privately. You fix it with a doctor. You fix it with a psychiatrist. You fix it with counseling. You fix it with talking it out. If the person, however, so let's say that they do have a sexual dysfunction and they won't go get help, then yeah, that's on them. Absolutely. And that's when you kind of got to go, why aren't they fixing this? Why aren't they working on this? What is the deal? Huh? I wonder what it is that's causing the fear that's keeping them from going to get help. So that's the question with that. Um, okay, so they will use things and they will go out into public and they will smear. And so that is another huge sign of a narcissist, an abuser, a malignant narcissist, a malignant abuser is when they bring private issues into the public and start telling anybody and everybody what's going on. And it's it's a way to harm, it's a way to devalue, it's a way to level, and it's a way to uh, one down somebody. It's a way to make them less than, and that's never a good thing. And that's what abusers do. Um, so, okay, so withholding sex, oh, forcing sex, yes. Okay, so the other thing sexually that abusers will do besides getting people to do things that they would not otherwise do or being weird about the sex, you know, wanting sex all the time in the beginning and then withholding it or then accusing the person of being a slut, a whore, uh, you know, overly sexual, a nymphomaniac, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they will then also use pregnancy as a way to control. 
So what I have seen abusers do is that they will get with somebody and the person has said point blank, I do not want children. I really don't want to have kids. It's not my thing. I'm not interested, et cetera, et cetera. And if this person that they've gotten with is an abuser, what will happen is, is that as soon as they get their hooks into them and they have got the relationship somewhat secured, they'll get pregnant. And they'll either get pregnant by an, oops, I forgot my birth control, or they will get pregnant by pushing, 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 pushing. I want kids, I want kids, I want kids, I want kids. I'm going to leave you if I don't have kids. If I want kids, I want kids. I'm going to leave you if I don't get kids. I want kids, I want kids. So the abused, the target of abuse is so freaked out about them leaving, they say yes. And then they end up in a situation where now they are tethered to this person for life because they've got kids together. And this is absolutely something that is intentional. I'm sorry, but in a healthy, normal relationship, y'all talk about this stuff before you get together. You talk about this stuff before you move in. You talk about whether you want kids. How many kids do you want? What are you thinking? I mean, some people are totally into it. Some people like get together and they're like, oh my gosh, yes, we want children. Absolutely, huzzah, go forth, procreate, have fun. But if you're with somebody who does not want children and you absolutely want children for the love of God and all that is holy, let them the fuck go. Seriously, if they don't want kids and you do, you're just asking for heartache down the line because this is a thing, guys. This is a huge issue. This isn't something that they're going to be like, oh, but they'll see how cute they are and, and just like a puppy and they'll decide that they want them. Uh, uh. Do you know how many abandoned puppies we have? Do you know how many abandoned kids we have because of that same attitude? Yeah, if somebody does not want kids, let them go. And if you do, find somebody who wants kids because they're not going to change. Um, yep, female abusers do that for sure, just a way to get supply. Well, and so here's the other thing I have seen them do. So they they use, <laughs> they, they either use the, um, uh, my abuser got me pregnant 12 times and only seven made it. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. Yeah, and they, oh, God. Okay, hold on. I, that's a thought that I need to talk about. Let me finish this thought, and then I'll get back to that thought. Okay, so they will get pregnant intentionally, or they'll push the person into getting, you know, having children. Or if there is the financial ability, they'll demand in vitro and they'll demand to get pregnant that way. It's again, it's not because they so badly want children, it's because they want something that's gonna tether you to them for the rest of their lives. And they want something that's gonna tether some other living creature to them for the rest of their lives because they need an unending supply of narcissistic supply. And kids, unfortunately, sometimes fill in that role, which is why it is so heartbreaking to see kids that were not really wanted that, you know, grow up and feel abandoned and feel betrayed and feel harmed and feel hurt because the narcissist didn't really want them. They just ended up abusing them. And then the other parent was just treading water, trying to keep their nose above water with the, the narcissist. So there really wasn't much parenting going on. So yeah, this is a, a bad situation. If, if you don't want kids, honor that. Trust your gut. If you don't want kids, trust it. When you're with the right person and you do want kids, you'll know it. If you have any questions whatsoever, then don't do it. Okay, so Leisha, that's a good point. So the other thing that abusers will do is that they will get their, and we're talking about male abusers to female abusers in this particular instance. Um, and the other ones can be either male or female. Um, so in this particular instance, what they'll do is the partner will start looking good. The partner will start losing weight. The star partner will start getting in shape. The partner will start doing things and bada bing, bada boom, they get them pregnant. And this is often in couples where there is some sort of religious constraints where, you know, birth control is not used or it's not allowed or whatever. And so it's, it's kind of like the abuser likes to keep the female target barefoot and pregnant. Why? Because what I've heard the abusers say is that, well, she's looking good and I don't want anybody else looking at her. So if she's pregnant, nobody will look at her. Oh my good God, Houston, we got a problem. So that's another thing that they will do is that, um, or <laughs> if you read my book, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him cha-cha available on print on demand on Amazon. I talk about cases where a, a religious abuser will poke holes in the condoms and, you know, because they're against it, they don't think that any condoms should be used, but the partner doesn't want to get pregnant but they poke holes in the condom and then lo and behold, they get pregnant and then it's like an oops, well, now we're pregnant, now we have to get married kind of thing. 
Yes, this shit happens, guys. I can't make this stuff up. Reality is weirder than any fiction anybody could ever come up with. Swear to God and all that's holy. So, um, yeah, they will do shit like that. They will sabotage uh, birth control. They will sabotage, you know, they'll, they'll accidentally on purpose lose the condom. They'll accidentally on purpose sabotage the condom, poke holes in it, do whatever. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, that's why if you're with somebody and they're love bombing you and they want babies really badly and you don't Houston get the hell out you got a problem um, are the abusers consciously aware of their plan yes absolutely this is this is not a oops I went unconscious no this is an I'm doing it on purpose um, or is it instinctive behavior real feelings of disgust for the other person no it is on purpose and they can <laughs> they can convince themselves that these are real feelings, but here's the clue. They don't have real feelings, guys. Remember, there's no there there. If there was a there there, there would be a moral compass. If there was a moral compass, they wouldn't be behaving the way that they are. And when there is no there there, they harm they, and they enjoy it. They're sadistic about it. It's like when I dealt with a female abuser several years ago and she got pregnant, the smirk on her face told me everything. I didn't need to question if this was an oops baby. This was an absolutely on purpose baby. You betcha. You betcha because the guy was on the way out and she decided that that's how she was going to get him to stay. So yeah, kids are used as pawns. Hello, if kids are used, look, wake up guys, listen to what I'm saying now, believe me later. If kids are used as pawns in divorces, what makes you think that they're not used as pawns as fetuses? Hello? These people do it absolutely on fucking purpose, period, exclamation point. They absolutely do it on purpose. They have children to please their parents. They have children to hook the person to you. They have children because they need somebody to love them. That's not the kid's job. That's not the kid's job. If you're having children because they're going to save the marriage or because they're going to fulfill you or you're going to live through them or you're going to, you know, be a stage dad or a stage mom or whatever that, uh-uh, uh-uh. Those kids don't need a job until they reach 18. And then it's one of their choosing. Do you see where I'm going with that? Abusers plan this shit out. They do. If they're using kids as pawns in the divorce, they're using kids as pawns as sperm. Sorry. They are. They are. Period. They are. That's what they do. That's who they are, period. Um, oh, okay, rape. So, okay, so Leisha, yeah, they they do. They, they will um, force sex on their partners when the partners are incapacitated. Absolutely. Um, they will use uh, roofies. They will use alcohol. They will use whatever they need to to get their way. Hold on, water. Um, so yeah, instead of trying to listen to your emotions gut, which they would try to manipulate, you have to use your brain. Think for yourself. Yeah, it's, it's really absolutely no, absolutely. They, they, they want, they get you in an emotional state and they use the emotional argument. They're just like car salesmen. So when they're trying to get somebody to have kids that doesn't want to have kids, they'll use every single emotional argument you can possibly think of. And if they're the communal narcissist type, they'll use the religious argument. They'll use the whole God wants us to, or we have to because God says, you know, go forth and, and procreate or prosper or whatever. I don't know. I'm getting that mixed up with Spock. But anyway, the point being is, is that they'll use the religious argument in order to push their agenda. They'll use any argument emotionally that they can to get their way. That is simply what abusers do. Uh, I worked in an over, I worked with an overt female narcissist, highly intelligent and qualified to degree level, who got into a new relationship in her early 30s, clock ticking, and didn't use protection, got pregnant by accident. Hmm, really? Yeah, there is no accident, especially when it comes to your health. I'm sorry. I knew exactly when my periods were going to happen because I tracked them because I'm kind of OCD that way. And now that I'm menopausal, I cannot tell you how happy I am. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's like you don't, this is not an, oops on accident thing. It's like taking on a human life is a huge responsibility. 
huge and narcissists do not take it seriously they don't they think that by getting pregnant they are cementing the relationship and showing how you know committed they are and what good parents they are and blah 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 but oftentimes what narcissists will do once they have the child is they will abdicate every single parental duty there is if they can get parents to raise their kid, they will. If they can get siblings to raise their kid, they will. If they're rich enough to hire nannies, they will. They have very little to do with the child once they actually come into this world. And if you're dealing with a male narcissist, again, they, they will have very little to do with the kid at all unless the kid is making them look good. So if the kid is you know, talented in some way or creative in some way or a natural in some way in something, the narcissist parent is only too happy to stand there and take credit for it when in fact it was probably somebody else who encouraged the kid to grow and change and be creative and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, the kids are just used as pawns. There's, they don't see them as a distinct separate identity because to a narcissist, to an abuser, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine and what's everybody is mine. That's kind of what they do. So um, there's no differentiation between that. Okay, so getting back to rape. Okay, so yes, they will use drugs, alcohol, et cetera, and force themselves on their partner. Um, you're dealing with a psychopath at that point. That's not just narcissism. You're dealing with somebody who is absolutely antisocial personality disorder. You betcha. So um, again, the difference between a narcissist and antisocial is Narcissists have this sense of entitlement. It's it's owed to them. They are so fantastic that the world just needs to give them everything on a silver platter. But they generally don't go and do things that are going to get them arrested necessarily. So, but um, uh, people with antisocial personality disorder, those are the so psychopaths, the sociopaths. Those are the ones who do things that very well could get them arrested and they don't care because the rules don't apply to them. They are better, they are this, they are that, and they think they can get away with it. So, and that's why I'm saying when you get down to the more malignant end of the spectrum, you're dealing with a narcopath. So a narcopath is like I said, narcissism, Machiavellianism, which is control freak, and then the psychopath. So they've got all of these psychopathy. They've got all of these things going on, and they are the ones who do the intentionally getting their partner pregnant all the time, uh, raping them when they're drunk or drugging them to rape them. Um, they are the ones that are doing these things because no is no, guys. It's just like the tea analogy. If somebody doesn't want to drink tea, you don't force it on them, period. Um, okay, so I was going somewhere else. Oh, incest. So this is the next one. So this is triggering, guys, so just hang with me. If, if it triggers you too badly, feel free to leave the discussion. Um, so incest, because somebody asked me, they're like, well, who, how, how does this happen? How the hell does this happen? Okay. Again, you're dealing with the further end of the spectrum. You're dealing with somebody who is narcissistic, Machiavellian, and probably psychopathy. So when a parent, especially, so we're going to deal with that and we're going to get to the sibling one in a second. When a parent is a narcopath, they cannot differentiate between them and somebody else. It's all them. Their thinking is so psychotic and so disordered that to them, they're entitled to pleasure themselves with whoever, whenever, at whatever time. Usually when you're dealing with somebody who is uh, an abuser with incest, they have usually been abused themselves. That does not excuse it, but it certainly explains it. So, when you're dealing with somebody who is a parent that is performing incest with children or with their their own you know kids or their own cousins or you know whatever um you're dealing with somebody who's probably been abused themselves probably because it's a learned behavior it's not you, you don't pop out of the womb and go hey i think i'm going to pretend i'm from the ozarks god please forgive me the ozarks and start you know having sex with my sister my brother my kids my whatever um when our first son was six months old i got pregnant but i didn't know due to stress being overloaded with my infant and being abused by him until i miscarried at 15 weeks Ooh. during our separation i told him after he was out of jail and his response was whatever you have to tell yourself to make yourself feel better about what you did what i mean talk about projection he had me so messed up i didn't even know he was always he would always tell me 
He felt like going to jail tonight before I left. That's how I knew he would lose his shit that night. Sorry for the ramble. No, Kaylee, you're fine. That's, yeah, they, they blame us for stuff, and it's it's crazy. It's, ugh. Anyway, back to the incest thing. So they have usually been abused themselves. They have got disordered thinking, obviously. There is that narcissism there that, you know, I can do no wrong, my wants, my needs, me, 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 I, I, more my genitals. And then you've got the ASPD, the antisocial personality disorder, which is the rules don't apply to me. Rules don't apply to me. So remember, when people are acting out abuse, they are being run by whatever age it was that they were themselves abused. Again, explains it, does not excuse it. So in other words, definitely what's going on is a repeat of whatever happened to them. However, it fucks up the kids that are being abused, obviously. So incest is an extreme form of the malignant dark triad. Incest is something that does happen with dark triads abso-fucking-lutely. So my dad was definitely borderline personality disorder with strong narcissistic expression and he molested all of us he did he tried his darndest and thank god he waited until we were like 12 13 14 so that we were old enough that we could be like uh no not happening have a nice day bye bye so the point being again let me show you this book so it's what's wrong with your dad available on um amazon print on demand, and yes, I talk about it, absolutely. fucking -lutely. My dad tried to molest me, my sisters, absolutely. He would do crazy things, I mean crazy things, and he didn't see anything wrong with it. And the funny thing of it is, is that um, when these abusers do it, if their partner is in the fog, if their partner is terrified to leave them because of financial stuff or because of emotional stuff or whatever, they could be standing right there watching it happen and not lift a finger. So this is where it gets confusing for the kids who are, you know, victim to, I hate to use the word victim, but this is where it gets confusing to the kids who are victim to this type of situation where you've got a narcissist and somebody with traits, traits of borderline, there is molestation going on, the borderline does nothing because they're afraid of being abandoned, the kids are then left to fend for themselves. Um, yep, stuck at their abuse and replay it over and over and over again with their relationships with their kids. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. So um, usually, and this is, Okay, this really fucks the kids up really, really, really badly because the kid now has, they're on their own and they realize they're on their own because the, the partner, whether it be the mom or the dad, whoever is the one who's not doing the abuse is also not protecting them. And that is abuse in and of itself, guys. That is abuse in and of itself. It is. And so because they're too afraid to leave, they're too afraid to get out of the situation because of being in the fog, because of being terrified of being abandoned, whatever the issue is. And so they literally sacrifice their kids on the altar of that relationship in order for them to stay safe. Guess why? Because however old they were when they got abandoned is what's running the show. This is why it's hugely important to work on that original issue so you don't keep doing it generation to generation to generation to generation. You've got to work on that inner child, period. So you don't act out stuff, period. <laughs> so there it is. So that's a really awful situation for a child to be in. And when I was going through it, I told teachers I did. I dropped planet size hints, hey, guys, something not right is going on here. This isn't normal. Help me. And the teachers turned a blind eye. And the reason they did, and I, because I asked another friend of mine who is now a teacher, and what she told me was, is that the paperwork involved was, is, was and is so huge that most teachers just don't want to get involved in it. And they're afraid of lawsuits. I'm sorry. You're a state mandated reporter. Guess what? You better fucking report this shit. So, you know, and that pisses me off because it's like, and I tell people when they come into my office, it's like, I'm a state mandated reporter. So, you know, everything that is said in this room stays in this room with some really important exceptions. If you tell me you're going to kill yourself, kill somebody else, elder abuse or child abuse, it will be reported. 
drop your fucking balls and fucking report and don't give a fuck about how much paperwork's involved. You're dealing with a child's life, you fuckheads. I'm sorry. I'm just a little passionate about that. Mm. Okay, breathe, breathe. It's okay. It's okay. Calm down. Okay. So that being said, um, okay. I could not leave a penny to my name. Older kids refused to go out with me. The only way I could leave is if I left kids with him wasn't going to do that. Yeah, you can't trust him to watch the kids, obviously. Um, okay. Yeah, mandatory. You know, reporting was mandatory. It's been mandatory for 20, 30, 40 years. It's been mandatory. So, um, so hey, Chris. Um, so yeah, no, it is it is mandatory. And it always has been mandatory. And even if it wasn't mandatory, I'm sorry, if a child came to me as a teacher and said, you know, Ms. Godinez, my dad's doing this or my mom's doing this. You bet your sweet fucking ass I'd go out and protect them. You goddamn straight I would. It's called have a fucking moral compass and do what's fucking right, period. Boom. Mic drop. Ooh, just dog face banana patch. Okay. Um, okay, so. All right. So that's what's going on when there is incest involved is that the person is acting out their own incest the person the parent who is not the abuser incestually is ineffectual they're unable to stand up and protect because they are in their own heads they are probably more than likely borderline personality disordered would be my guess because that's the usual combination is a, a malignant narcissist the dark triad with a borderline because they're so easily manipulated because of the emotional dysregulation. They're so terrified of abandonment that they will sacrifice their children in order to keep themselves financially sound and to stay not abandoned. So when a kid is in that situation and they go to the teachers and they do nothing, the kid is totally on their own. And what that kid has learned is that no one can be trusted. And that sucks fucking ass hard time. So, and this is another reason why I'm concerned about um, school counselors because they don't cover this stuff in school. They don't. They do, this, this stuff, guys, they don't even touch because it's controversial and it's uncomfortable and, oh my God, you'll have to actually do something about it. And, oh my God, you're going to have to not be afraid of going to court. And, oh my God, you're going to be doing a shit ton of paperwork. Oh, well. So yeah, they don't even touch it in school. They don't talk to us about how to help a kid who's in this situation. They don't. They absolutely don't. And it's that to me is a fucking crime. Okay. Um, I volunteer with St. John's Ambulance here in the UK. Every disclosure of abuse is recorded, reported, and investigated. Every single one. Good. Good. Good on you. Good on them. Fan fucking tastic. Yeah, it's it is amazing to me how many people turn a blind eye to it. And it is amazing to me how many people are afraid of getting involved. Oh, I don't want to get involved. Oh, I don't want to. Oh, you know, uh, I'm sorry. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I if there's a dog running down the freeway, I will fucking pull over. You know why? Because I can. Is it an inconvenience? Is it dangerous? You bet your sweet ass it is. Every single time somebody is being abused, I will do something about it. Is it fucking inconvenient? Is it dangerous? You bet it is. I'm going to fucking do it anyway. Yeah, it just it fucking pisses me off when I hear counselors going, oh, well, uh, or teachers, oh, well, uh, it's like, uh, uh, your job is to fucking report. And I'll tell you what, if I know a counselor is not reporting, I fucking turn them in because I don't put up with that shit. Motherfuckers. OK, sorry. Just mm, it's, it's, it's a slightly impassioned thing for me. So anyway. All right. I totally got derailed. I am so sorry. Let me get back on track. Okay, so now, the other thing that I have seen is families coming together, okay? So we're talking Brady Bunch. We're talking like, you know, this person who was abused in the relationship got out finally, got the help, and is now getting together with somebody else who got out of a bad relationship, and they're making a family in and of their own. Hold on a second, people are writing stuff. People turn a blind eye to abuse when you're a child. It makes the world feel so unsafe, yes, and it makes you feel so alone, yes, like there's no help, yes. Um, how can we feel like the world is safe and people care again? Well, what you do is you don't ever shut up. Hello? <laughs> you don't ever shut up. 
You don't ever shut up about it. You, here's the thing. When we have been abused, when anybody has been abused, we do one of a couple of options. We either become a complete and total victim and we just roll over and give up, or we become a fucking champion and we make sure that this does not happen to another living creature ever again, period. Not on my fucking watch. Do you see what I'm saying? So you got a choice. And, and are people reprehensible? Yeah, they can be. Are there good people out there? Yes, there are. You've got to find them. And the best way to find them is to work on you, is to get you rock solid, to trust your gut again, to listen to your logic. Not always listening to your heart. Your heart will steer you wrong. Occasionally your head will steer you wrong, but your gut will never steer you wrong. So you work on your self-esteem. You do the self-esteem workbook. You get with a good therapist. You work through that motherfucking childhood where you were abused. You bet. You heal that original wound. You do the inner child work. That is how you make your world safe again. Because what you will find is as you heal that stuff, you find your tribe. You find the people who are trustworthy. You find the people who are honest. You find the people who get it. You find the people who are fearless and who are not afraid to confront abusers. That's what you find. So you start working on that, and that is what's going to get you to where you need to go. You got to work on that inner child. You got to heal that original wound, and you got to have a list of deal breakers. Work on the self esteem workbook by Glenn Schiraldi, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. Get with a good therapist, work it through EMDR, do whatever you need to do, get that shit handled, nail down those nails, and then you will find your tribe because you will start calling to you the people that are of the same wavelength. Um, Okay, where was I? Uh, uh, hmm. Okay, all right, where was I? Uh, does healing mean you don't get angry anymore? Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. So you don't get as angry anymore. So healing means you allow. Healing means you have whatever emotions you have. So here, for example, when I was in the relationship with my mom and dad, my mom and dad were completely fucked up. Again, you want to know how fucked up? Read this book. What's wrong with your dad? Available on Amazon, print on demand. I talk about it. I talk about it, guys. I talk about what I went through and how I got from point A to point wherever the hell I am now. So um, you are going to be angry. You are absolutely fucking lutely going to be angry. And it's O fucking K as long as caveat, you're taking it out on the right way and on the right thing. So Pete Walker talks about this. He's like, turn your shame into righteous anger. Put it back on the abuser. Put it back where it belongs. It belongs on the person who did those horrible things, not with us. Are we going to be angry? You bet your sweet ass we are. Anger is a part of the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn syndrome. So it's like anger is a natural response to having been hurt because we're trying not to be hurt again. And when our parents do shit like that to us, when they ignore abuse, when they allow us to be abused, because at that point we don't have any agency. We're kids. We have no power. We have no money, no voting. We have no power. So, and we can't walk away and go, y'all are fucked up unless we do a whole um, emancipation. Uh, you can, you can be emancipated and it depends on the state. And I don't know what the different states are, but you could be emancipated. But in order to be emancipated, you have to prove that you can hold a job and that you can pay rent. How many kids can do that without a car? You know, I mean, it's it's really hard to get away from abusers. I left home at 17. I did. But thank God I had a sister I could rely on who was like a second mom. So that's when I started going, <laughs> y'all are fucked, you know, and I left and got the hell out of there. But a lot of kids can't do that. So somehow I got off track. What the hell? Oh, anger. Yes. So you're going to be angry. It's going to happen and it's okay. And you can write angry letters to your abuser and to the parent who did not protect you. And we often have very mixed emotions. See, this is another thing that fucks kids up when there's incest involved. They love the parent, but they hate the parent because the parent is their parent. And there were some good things about that parent, but dear God, they did this to me. And oh my Lord, this is weird. And oh my God, do you see where I'm going with this? So if you are the victim of incest, get with a therapist, get with a therapist, work this shit through, get with EMDR, get the CPTSD workbook, work it 
through. You're going to be angry. It's going to happen. But the good news is, is that at first we're angry at everything. We're angry at everything and everybody. Oh my God. I think I've said this before. John used to tease me. He'd be like, this is Chris happy. Arr! This is Chris sad. Arr! This is Chris relaxing. Arr! I was mad a lot all the fucking time. Why? Well, because my abuser kept telling me, you can't be mad at me. I'm your dad. You can't be mad at me. That's not what God wants. You can't be mad at me. Blah, 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 blah. So it was never okay to be angry. So as soon as I got out of my own, guess what? I turned into the incredible She-Hulk, green and everything. I mean, it was not pretty. So yeah, when you start healing, you can be angry appropriately and to the right target. Does that make sense? And that does not mean you're going to call your parents up and tell them what pieces of shit they are. It means you're going to write it out. You're going to get it out of your head. You're going to get it onto paper. You're going to trot it out to the barbecue, read it out loud once, and burn it. Now, somebody did uh, write in and said that their healing master told them not to read it. You know, it depends if it, if it gives you. Because the way I do it is when I trot things out to the barbecue and I read it, I read it like a fucking declaration of goddamn independence. It's like, okay, universe, here it is boom and then I let it go and then I put it on the barbecue light it on fire let it go so it depends on how you want to do it some people get angrier when they read it other people's it, it feels like okay I've just made this declaration here it is not gonna let anybody abuse me again boom shakalaka there we go so it depends on what works for you so yeah we are going to get angry we are it's gonna happen anger is normal it is natural but it is not natural to be angry all the time and it's also not natural to take it out on everybody and their dog you want to put it back on where it belongs if that makes any sort of sense and if these people have never gotten it you go no contact or low contact and that's what I had to do with my parents is I went very 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 low contact like really didn't have much to do with them until later so um Okay, where did I go? Holy cow. Uh, yes, it is. The anger gets better because it's actually efficient. You're actually not just spraying it like, you know, like a uh, salt gun, salt, shotgun salt. You're, you're actually focusing it on where it needs to go. What are you angry about? How did you get hurt? Who hurts you? How did you get hurt? Why are you angry? What are you feeling? How do you not want to be hurt again? So let's say to the abuser that molested you, dear abuser, fuck the fuck out of fucking fuck you, you fucking asshole. You did this, 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 this. I felt this, 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 this. This is how angry I have been for X number of years. And guess what? You're the problem, not me. And you go through it. And at some point, you are going to come to compassion not right now at some point you will come to compassion so for example that's why I said in the beginning if you look at incest people people who do incest they are acting out something that has happened to them and they pick very specific ages so like I said for all of my sisters and me it was around age 12 13 so something happened to my dad around age 12 or 13 I don't know what He's dead. I'm not going to ask him because he's dead. But <laughs> something happened at age 12 or 13 because he did this to every single child, at female child, at age 12 or 13. So something went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs for him at age 12 or 13. I don't know what, but there it is. And that's why they are attracted to certain ages, because whatever happened to them happened at that age. Does that excuse it? Absolutely not. Does it explain it? It makes things make a hell of a lot more sense. You betcha. So at some point you have compassion for that and you let them go. It's like you didn't break them. You cannot fix them. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Deal with whatever karma they're going to deal with. Let them go. Ain't nobody got time for this shit. Let them go. So, okay. Um, all right. Uh... Yeah, anger is just another emotion, and emotions are neither good nor bad. It is what we do with them that make them either, either helpful or hurtful. So remember that. It's like if you're taking out your anger on everybody, then yeah, that's hurtful. If you're directing it into a letter and working through the issues and letting it go, then that's helpful. Does that make sense? And generally, confronting the abuser is not going to do a whole lot of good because they are so far gone that there's no there there. So it doesn't do any good to confront them. This is all about us, guys. This is all about healing. This is all about moving forward. Because remember, if you're not moving forward, you're regressing. You're moving backwards. There is no such thing as stuck. So there is that. Um, 
Okay, hold on. Whoa, more th stuff. Hang on. Uh, What's Wrong With Your Dad is a great book. A real page turner to read it straight through. Thank you, Shannon. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, I love Pete Walker's CPTSD book. It speaks to me in so many ways. Yes. Now, the thing I got to say again about the CPTSD book is it is going to trigger you like nobody's business. Take it in tiny, tiny little chunks. Like tiny, tiny little chunks. Like if, if the, <laughs> I had one person where even just reading the title page triggered them and that's okay. So you take it at your own pace, but do read the book. It is immensely healing, immensely helpful. So, um, but it will trigger you and have a journal ready and write it out, get it out of your head, get it onto paper, burn it, let it go so that you're not stuck with it and make sure you have a good therapist to help work through all of this stuff. Um, one of the biggest problems in unearthing and dealing with the original wound is that you have to get past the feeling of being disloyal to your parents. Yes, because why? Because abusers love to use the whole, I'm your parent, I'm the authority, even though I'm abusing the shit out of you, even though I'm beating you or screaming at you or molesting you or whatever it is I'm doing. So don't you dare get mad at me. I'll give you something to be mad about. You know, that whole thing. There's a huge fear when we go to deal with a parent abuser. Absolutely, because they have instilled this obey. You must obey. You must obey. You must obey. And if you look at it, that's what sets us up for getting involved in relationships later on that mimic that original abuse. We must obey. We must obey. We must obey. Yeah, it's it's no bueno. That's why you got to work on the original wound. And is it scary? Yeah, you betcha. So you've got to get over the feeling of being disloyal. You've got to get over it because, honey, you don't owe them anything. If you were not related to them, would you have anything to do with them? If the answer is no, act accordingly, period. You just don't. It's like if they've abused you, they've abused you, period. You know, and you can still love them. And see, this is the dichotomy that children of abuse, adult children of abuse, go through. It's like, on the one hand, they're your parent, and you love them, and you feel this loyalty to them. And on the other hand, you hate them because of the things they did to you. So it, that's the cognitive dissonance, and that's why it's really a good idea to get with a therapist to work through all of that stuff and to be able to learn how to live with that dichotomy. It's always going to be there. There's always going to be a part of us that will love them, and there's always going to be a part of us that absolutely hates them. Yeah, it's just the way it is. And that does not mean that they're mutually exclusive. It just means that there was a part of them that was lovable, and then there was a part of them that was absolutely hateful. And we got to learn to live with that. And that's hard. That's hard. So I want to validate that is not easy. And that is very difficult to start moving through, but not impossible. Um, how to cope with mixed feelings towards the abusive parents. I often feel pity for them that they can't escape their pain. And sometimes I would like to help them. But then again, I hate their guts. <laughs> how do I reconcile this with myself? So kind of what I was just talking about. Um, so we can't fix another person. We can't. It'd be lovely if we could. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just walk up to people and go, here, do this. Your life will be so much better. People are going to do what people are going to do. So, you know, for years, my sisters and I told my mom, leave him. He's abusive. Leave him. Get out of this situation. Leave him. And she came up with every excuse in the book why she couldn't go. And it, it all sounded very logical and very wonderful, but it was bullshit. It was. And people choose. And some people choose to not be done being abused. It's a choice. It's an absolute choice. When people are done being abused, they're done being abused. But until they choose to be done being abused, they're going to continue to be abused. And some people, it's a learned helplessness, if that makes any sort of sense. Hang on just a second. So it's a learned helplessness. It's a Victim, 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 look at me, look at me, I'm a victim kind of thing. It's They're getting a payoff from it. What's the payoff in staying with the abuser? What's the payoff in staying in this horrible situation? What's the payoff in not being happy? What's the payoff? You always got to look at it. What are they getting out of it? And it, they will not leave the situation until the, the pain outweighs the payoff. And sometimes that never happens. So you just kind of got to get over wanting to heal them or help them because they don't want the help. They really don't. They don't. You know, if somebody wants help, they have to ask for it. 
And if they ask for it, then you can help them. But if you help them after they've asked for it and they go right back to doing the same thing, they didn't really want the help. They just wanted the attention. And that's the difference. It's like somebody who really truly wants change, guess what? They will ask for help and they will change. Those who really don't will sit there and go, help me, help me, help me. Oh, oh yeah, help me. Oh yeah, good. Oh good, good, good. I'm getting the attention. Oh yay. Oh no, I still need help. Nuh uh. That's not, mm -mm. that's not really wanting to change. That's getting attention through, you know, learned helplessness. Um, so with reconciling it within yourself, it's like, yes, you're always going to love them. Like I said, you're always going to, to feel sorry for them. It's like, wow, that sucks. Hey, sucks to be you kind of thing. But also, A, you did not break them. You cannot fix them. You can show them the way if they ask. But other than that, you got to let it go. Let it go. Work on you. Let it go. You cannot fix them. So a good book to get over that is The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker. Great book. Read it, live it, do it. Because we get stuck in this, we have to say yes bullshit from our parents. Don't you tell me no. Oh, yeah, motherfucker, I am going to tell you no. You've got to draw boundaries. you got to have boundaries. you got to have a list of deal breakers. You know, if they're not helping themselves, uh-uh. There's a difference between a hand out and a hand up. If they're going for a hand up, that's great. If they're going for a hand out, not so much, if that makes any sort of sense. Okay, it is a long process. Absolutely. It's it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime process. It's It really is, and it takes time to plow through the abuse and it takes time to plow through the self-loathing that they've given to us that was really theirs, that they tried to make think was ours. Um, and it takes time to heal and it takes time to get to compassion. Absolutely. And, and the difference is, and I want to make this very clear again, you do not participate in idiot compassion. So Pima Chodron talks, who's the American Buddhist nun, talks about idiot compassion. There is having compassion, understanding the situation. Okay, yes, I get it. They themselves were abused. They themselves are um, acting out of a uh, reactionary stance, a baby soul. They're not getting it. They're not ever going to change. I can have compassion for them from afar. Idiot compassion is where you continually allow them to abuse you while you're trying to fix them. Uh-uh, that's idiot compassion. So don't have idiot compassion. You can have compassion, but have it from afar. You don't need them in your life. Okay, um, what's your relationship with your parents now? They're dead. <laughs> so let me, <laughs> it's great, they're dead. Um, so my dad and I kind of came to an understanding. So how do I explain this? He was very abusive, absolutely. fucking Did I like him? Absolutely not. I did not like him at all. I, however, realized at the last end of his life that he was never going to change. I could not change him. I could not fix him. I could not make him see the light. I couldn't make his life any better. He was always going to be miserable. He was always going to be addicted He because he was addicted to opiates. He was addicted to uh, alcohol and to codeine. Um, so, and he would doctor shop. And I... I and he would never, you know, people tried to tell him, they're like, it's in your head, you need help, you need to go to a therapist, blah, blah, blah. And he refused. He had chance after chance after chance after chance to go to therapy, and he refused. So I finally came to the conclusion, it was like, okay, I cannot change him. I can only change my reaction to him. So when he was at the end of his life, he would call me occasionally, and he would tell me these absolutely horrible sexist racist jokes and I just kind of adopted what John my husband does or did with him which was yeah I can see how you think that's funny <laughs> just leave it at that and he would take that as agreeing with him which you know fine whatever I'm not going to argue but you know and so I just kind of did that with him and he would tell me all about his day and you know all of this stuff and then I you know he'd never ask about me and I'd be like oh okay and then he'd get off the phone and everything was fine the last conversation I had with him he told a horrible racist sexist joke oh I can see how you think that's funny and then you know he told me all about his day and then I was like okay honey I love you and I said okay I love you too and got off the phone with him and the next day he was dead and I feel good about the way I came to peace with it, which was, I can't fix them. It's not my job. I can't, all I can do is change me. 
you know, and I can honor and love that part of him that was lovable because there wasn't a whole lot that was lovable about him, but there were some things that were. And so when he died, I had a clear conscience. It wasn't like, you know, he died and I was like a fucking mess because I screamed at him or I told him how much I hated him or, you know, whatever. And, you know, I did that in therapy with my, my therapist. So, but my sister, one of my sisters, he called her up and said the same joke to her. And she came unhinged, unglued, screamed at him, yelled at him. The next day he was dead. I'll give you three guesses how good she did. Not very good. She handled his death very hard and very, very difficult for her to process through because she couldn't reconcile the two feelings. So. That's why it's important to reconcile it. That's why it's important to understand it. That's why it's important to come to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A grace with it. It's like, yes, you love them. Yes, you also hate them. There it is. You can't fix them. You can't. You do the best you can. You can't. You can't fix them. That's it. Um, with my mom, she wants, and here's the weird thing. So she has very strong traits of borderline, okay? And I talk about it again in this book, What's Wrong, hello, I'm just trying to get the camera where it is. What's Wrong With Your Dad, available on uh, Amazon Print On Demand. So I talk about it in, uh, in my book, is that when my dad died, my mom did a 180. It was like she suddenly came up out of the fog, her abuser was dead, her mother was also dead. Her mother was a horrific narcissist. I couldn't stand the woman. And um, she came into her own. And she started, you know, she lived by herself and she stayed out on our ranch in Gridley and she had two shotguns by her bed and a baseball bat under her pillow and she, she took care of herself and she kind of came around. I mean, she really became a very, very different person. I mean, she had some aspects to her that were really, you know, that learned victimhood, that kind of thing that she still kind of did, but it wasn't to the extent that it was when my dad was alive. So it was very, it was really weird to watch. So it was like when my dad dropped dead, my mom suddenly became the mom that I'd wished she'd been for the last 45 years. So it, it was weird. It was weird watching that. So she and I actually had a really good relationship because we talked and I called her the carpet on shit. And, you know, we talked and 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 talked. And it was really, it was really good. And I miss her. I do. I miss that part of her that came around. I miss that. I miss the mom that I was able to have for the last, what was it, 20 years maybe? Because dad died in 96. 96? Did he die in 96? Yeah, he died in 96. So, no, 97. So, yeah, from 97 until 2016, 2015. Yeah. So we had a really good relationship after that. And I fucking called her on everything and she apologized and, you know, we talked and she realized what she was doing and she started reading books and she started getting better. And we had a good relationship by the time she died. So, I mean, over those, the course of that 15, 20 years, yeah, we, we worked things through and that was doable because she was at the traits of end. I want to make that very clear. If she had been further along, if she had been, you know, absolutely malignant, if she had not had a come to Jesus moment, if she had not started work on herself, if she had not started talking, if she had not started taking responsibility, no, I would not have had a good relationship with her because I wouldn't have put up with it. So, um, so that's that. Hope that answers your question. So, okay. Um, what about siblings? Okay. So incest with siblings. So again, those, ch those children have been molested in some way, shape, or form. Kids do not pop out of the womb molesting. They don't. And so um, when somebody is um, molesting their siblings, they're somehow being molested. And again, this is what bothers me, is in our society, we don't talk enough about this. We don't. It's a taboo subject, and we can't talk about it, and we can't talk about sex, period. Oh, my God. So if there is molestation going on between siblings, the person who's doing the molesting has been uh, molested themselves. That's where I was going. Thank you. Oh my God. Okay. Sorry. So Brady Bunch families coming together. So sometimes what will happen is there will has, have been, um, incest going on and the, the family comes together. Now you've got a sibling over here on one side or the other that has been molested and they're desperately acting out their own molestation on now the siblings because they're trying to work through what was done to them. That is what happens. So as soon as the parent recognizes that there is um, 
sibling abuse going on, obviously you separate them from the siblings, you get them into therapy, you, you do whatever you need to do. And then the problem, problem becomes is you'll have that other parent there that is probably the abuser or who allowed the abuse to continue and did nothing interfering. They'll try to keep the kid from going to therapy. They'll try to interfere. They'll try to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hold on water, really getting warm. Ha, oh, hello menopause. Mm. Okay. So, um, kids don't know how to do this stuff. It's taught to them. So a parent will often feel incredibly guilty. Oh my God, I didn't know. I didn't know. How could I have missed this? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Take a deep breath, guys. Take a deep breath. Cause what is the number one thing that abusers tell their victims? Don't tell. Don't tell. If you tell, I will kill your cat. I will kill your dog. I'll kill your mom. I'll kill your dad. Don't tell. That's what they say. That is what these people say. They tell their victim, their target, to not tell. So oftentimes the parent will miss it until the behavior comes out in the child that's being abused. They'll become overly sexual or they'll know things that they shouldn't know or they'll be angry and acting out and what's going on and, you know, this type of thing. So, um, yeah, it's really... <sighs> It's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So the best and biggest thing I can say is as soon as the abuse is, is caught, get everybody in therapy. And I mean everybody, family therapy for everybody and get this handled and get the abuser into a program to deal with that, especially if they're a minor, they're acting out their abuse. It does not excuse it, but it certainly explains it. So get them into a program for that age group that's appropriate to help them deal with their abuse as well. Cause now here's the double, double whammy that this kid is dealing with. They've been abused. They are also the abuser. And now they're having to deal with the shame and the guilt of having been abused and the shame and the guilt of having abused somebody else. This is a sucky situation. So that's why I'm saying therapy for everybody. Fucking therapy for everybody. You bet your sweet baby. Um, beating yourselves up is not going to do any good. You caught the abuse when you could. Remember, abusers tell their target to stay quiet and don't tell anybody. And they use threats. They use threats to keep them quiet. So it is hard to find it. You know, it's like, and, and it's not, how do I explain this? It's not like, you wake up in the morning and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to look for all of these signs of abuse. It doesn't even cross your mind usually until it becomes apparent. So try not to beat yourself up. You caught it when you could. Get everybody into therapy. Do the repair that you can. That is the best thing that you can do. And remember that this child who is the perpetrator is also a victim and dealing with a double whammy. And so it's it's hard not to be angry that they acted out, but it's it's also imperative that you recognize that they are dealing with more than one thing going on. So they themselves were also abused because incest among siblings, it's learned. It's a learned behavior. The, the abuser, the perpetrator has been molested themselves and they are acting out. So, and then the people who, the kids who are being abused absolutely have to get into therapy to deal with that so that they can get boundaries and understand that they must speak up and that when anybody makes a threat to them, they can tell the nearest adult. So there's that. I hope that answered the question. Um, yeah, you can't allow any more abuse. That's idiot. That's idiot compassion. Um, be done being abused. Um, oh, honey. Yeah. If, if this, cause this is a trigger. I know if this, if you guys are feeling like you're disassociating, feel free to check out. It's cool. You know, come back to it when you can, listen to as much as you can, and then come back and in and out and, and just, just take care of you. Drink water, take care of you, stay in the present, stay in the present, stay in the present. That's why I was saying this, this whole discussion is going to trigger a lot of people. So about emotional incest and being raised to be parentified, how to cut the guilt about ourselves being happy when our parents are good people deep down, but are mentally ill and sad all the time, how to feel we deserve happiness when they didn't get all the happiness they deserve. Okay. So again, the disease to please by Harriet Breaker. So what happens with parents who are mentally ill is that they cause us, or physically disabled, they cause us to become the caregiver. And when we become the caregiver, we take on all of the roles that they should be doing. So they, we become the second parent. We become uh, the person who's caring for all the kids. In really dysfunctional families, we become the second spouse, the second wife, the second husband. This is where the incest stuff comes in. So um, 
this is this is why it's really important as an adult survivor of a dysfunctional family to really really start working on yourself really really start working on the self-esteem getting rid of that original wound work on the codependency work on the disease to please by Harry Breaker it is not our job so they did not get everything that they could have had a lot of the world does not get everything that they could have had you cannot change that you did not break it you cannot fix it all you can do is you that's it your little corner of the world that's it you make your little corner of the world as bright and as beautiful as you possibly can you help the people that want to have help and the ones who refuse to get help let them go let them go um, okay late to the party got the timing wrong hi Chris <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> hi Laura um, Laura sorry um, okay uh, disease to please I could only read that book in short segments hit close for me to handle too much at once okay yeah that's another book that is probably going to trigger people so just be aware you know if we're codependent we recognize ourselves in it and when we recognize ourselves in it we have tendency to you know disassociate or really you know ah! Oh my god this is me so take it in tiny chunks but do take it do get through that book read the whole book work the worksheets do what you need to do stop being codependent stop helping people that don't want help and stop um, you know killing yourself to fix somebody that doesn't want to be fixed um, okay uh, I so thank you for talking about this the philosophy of idiot compassion has so helped me and my husband deal with our situation with my mother good I'm glad I could help uh, honestly, I think I had dealt with my mother and all the issues. No contact now for over 25 years. No longer angry. Uh, even now, I feel that I'm at peace with it all. So my last relationship was abusive, and with a narcissistic person. Does that mean I'm not healed from my mom? I'm confused. If you got into a narcissistic relationship, there is something that did not get fixed. So figure it out. It's like what. What led you to not listen to your gut? How did you ignore the red flags? What did you tell yourself when you were ignoring the red flags? Did you say, oh, no, those don't exist? So the denial kind of thing, what's going on? So that's, that's the way to start working on that. It's like, how did you learn to not listen to your gut? Who taught you not to listen to your gut? So that's things like that. So we may be at peace with the person on one level, but if we're still getting involved in abusive relationships, we're still working on something. So go back through with a therapist, figure it out. It's like, how did you start ignoring the red flags? When, when did that happen? Where did that happen? What red flags did you ignore? What did you tell yourself? What was the internal dialogue? What was going on? That's what that's how you start working on that uh, what's a good book on forgiveness for my benefit I can't grasp the concept I try many times I've tried to grasp it from different people and their way of explaining it maybe I need to work on or expunge something else in order to be able to understand this and be able to do it okay so here's the deal guys with forgiveness especially when there was a severe amount of abuse going on so you have to get through the anger first you have to get through the anger first it, it drives me crazy when you have people who are like oh you just have to forgive them no no if you're still pissed you can forgive them and still be pissed and that means you're not really forgiving so <laughs> it's you got to get through the anger you got to get through the anger you got to get through the anger and you got to put it on the appropriate thing and the appropriate person and then you can start working on compassion and that is totally different from the concept of forgiveness so in Western society we have this idea where we do this whole forgive and forget thing that's a great way to be abused again it's a great way to be abused again you don't forgive and forget you forgive or you have compassion but you learn from it and you move forward and you make sure it never happens again period um, so forgiveness is not what we think it is forgiveness is not for the other person it's not it's for us it's for us it's letting that shit go so a couple of great books that I love is um, radical acceptance by Tara Brock radical acceptance by Tara Brock the other one is radical forgiveness by Colin tipping radical forgiveness by Colin tipping so oftentimes when we come from abusive paths when our parents have been abusers and we grow up we get this overdeveloped sense of vengeance <laughs> and what we do is is we wear the resentment and we we make it part of who we are and that's not who we are that's not who we are so it's hard to let go of wrongs because our ego gets in the way and it says I'm right they're wrong I'm gonna hang on to this I've got this 
righteous anger and I have a right to be resentful and I have a right to hang on to this and I'm not going to forgive them and da 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 da. What are you thinking about the whole time? What is your entire existence turned into? Thinking about your abuser, thinking about them, thinking about the anger, thinking about this, thinking about that. Forgiveness is not about them. Forgiveness is about us. Forgiveness is letting this stuff go. So resentment is like picking up two hot coals intending to throw them at somebody else and we're the only ones getting burned. So forgiveness and compassion is letting those hot coals drop and healing, 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 letting it go. That's what that's all about. So those two books, Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock and Radical Forgiveness by Colin Tipping have been immensely helpful in people that are struggling with the forgiveness aspect. It's not so much about the other person, it's about us. It's about us. So work on that. Um, I understand that you had compassion for him, but I don't understand how you loved him. I don't know that I will ever get there. So here's the thing, Susan. Whew. This is going to be a meta thing, not a micro thing. The universe is love. Love is the greatest force in the universe. There were things about my dad that I loved. There really were. He had an immense intelligence. He was amazing. This man could quote shit like nobody's business. He could quote Shakespeare. He could quote Aristotle. He could quote, I mean, he knew stuff, Latin. He knew all sorts of things. He instilled in me a love of history. There were things about him that were lovable. There were things about him that were lovable. There was an aspect of his soul that was lovable. There really was. But then there was another aspect of him that was absolutely evil. Reconcile that. So what you do is you reconcile it. It's like, okay, I love that part of him. Absolutely. This other part of him, nope, not so much. Never will. Uh-uh. But I did love him as a soul, as a child of God, as a child of the universe. Love is the greatest force. Love is the greatest power. That's what's going to get us through all this shit. <laughs> so... So yeah, it's hard and, and it takes time to get there. It takes time to get there. And it's a very, it's a spiritual journey. It's a intellectual journey. It is a journey of self-discovery and a journey of, do I want to hang on to the hatred and the anger? Is that serving me anymore? Now, that does not mean I'm ever going to forget what he did. You bet. because And because of what he did, is who I am today, so I kind of have to thank him in a way. But I also have a list of deal breakers. It's like, uh-uh, nobody is ever going to touch me in a way I don't want to be touched ever again. Nobody is ever going to hurl, you know, epithets at me ever again. I'll block them, I'll get rid of them, I'll report them, I'll do whatever I need to do. So you, you let it go. <sighs> You have a list of deal breakers. You can acknowledge and love the person for being a soul, for being a child of the universe, for a part of them that is lovable, but then you also acknowledge there was a part of them that wasn't absolutely. You let it go. Let it go. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, 2016 is when my mom died. Good God. Losing my mind. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Uh, I found help with Lisa Romero's, Romano's meditations on healing the inner child. They're on YouTube. Great, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you for posting that. So Lisa A. Romano's meditations on healing the inner child on YouTube. Guys, go look it up. It's a good thing. Um, <laughs> hi, Megan. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, hi, Sue. Um, yeah, if you haven't forgiven them, you're just not ready, guys. This is a process. I think in our society, we have this idea that forgiveness is instantaneous. It is a process. I mean, it took me years to get to the point where I could think of my dad in a loving way, you know, and seven years on a couch doing intense psychoanalysis of what was going on, you know. So it, it takes work and it takes time. Don't expect things to be instantaneous. There is no instant gratification with this. It's a process. It's a process. It's a process. So don't beat yourself up if you're not there yet. Um, okay, so somebody did a Lisa Romano YouTube stuff, did her 12-week program. Highly recommend it. Do it. Do it. If people are saying this is working, do it. Okay. Um, 
Forgive to Win in Self-Sabotage by Walter E. Jacobson. Great book. Okay, Forgive to Win in Self-Sabotage by Walter E. Jacobson. Okay, good book. Okay, uh, I know this is off topic, but it's been a rough week, so I just wanted to say how good it is to be able to tune in. Thank you for doing what you do. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. This is this. You guys are the reason why I do this. Um, okay. All right. So, good Lord. I hope I have covered everything. Let me make sure. I'm going to recap here. Okay. So, abusers will use sex in the beginning of the relationship to hook people in, say that they like sex, say that they like certain sex acts, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon as they come into the relationship, get their hooks into you, move in with you, get the ring, marry you, whatever, sex dries up, goes bye bye. Um, they will then accuse you of all of their issues so they'll do the you 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 guns they will also use any sexual dysfunction that's going on to humiliate and uh, manipulate and uh, try to drag you down so um, be careful of that if somebody does that if somebody like jokingly says something about you not being good in bed dump them because that ain't nobody's business it isn't and if there's a problem in the bedroom they should bring bringing that to you not to the general public um, Incest is very hard on the survivors. It is very hard on the children who are acting out, who are now the perpetrator and molesting other siblings. Because remember, they too were abused and they are having to deal with the guilt of being abused and of acting out with the other siblings. So that situation needs to get immediate you know, separation, the kid needs to be separated from the other siblings and he needs to, he or she, because the females can be abusers as well, needs to be in a program for uh, perpetrators, but also for victims. So it's a dual thing. Make sure you get somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing because you don't want to fuck this kid up any more than they already are. You also want to get help for the children that have been molested. And the parents are going to need help for feeling, dealing with the guilt of not catching it immediately. Um, okay. Forgiveness, talked about forgiveness. Talked about sex, withholding sex. I think I've covered everything. If there is anything else that you guys, whoa, there is, hang on. Um, I'm not anxious to rush to forgive. I've tried that before. Yeah, slow it down, slow it down. You don't have to forgive immediately. Uh-uh, read those books, work through it. it. You'll get there eventually, hon. Give yourself time, give yourself time. Um, how does forgiveness work with the dark triad? You, okay. So here's the deal, guys. Dark triads, it's not about them, it's about us. It's not about them, it's about us. So the forgiveness is forgiving us, forgiving ourselves, forgiving whatever. So it's not about them. The dark triads, they are harmful, they are hurtful, they've hurt us, but they've also hurt themselves. If you're gonna look at it in a metaphysical, I'm gonna go, me and Melanie Tanya Evans are gonna go way out there now. If you're gonna look at it on a metaphysical level, they're also hurting them. You cannot hurt another person without destroying a part of your own soul. That sucks. Sucks to be them. It does. Doesn't mean I want them around me, but Jesus Christ, it sucks to be them. I wouldn't want that. Uh -uh, no way. So it's not about them. It's about us. It's about what we do with it. It's about dropping those hot coals. It's about recognizing that they too are suffering. So if you look at it from a Buddhist perspective, suffering is about attachment. Attachment causes suffering. When we are stuck in the hatred and we are stuck in punishing and we are stuck in all of that, we are attached. Therefore, we are suffering. <laughs> no bueno. That's why you want to let it go. Let it go. And they're going to suffer whatever consequences that they're going to suffer. The karma is going to hit them in some way, shape, or form. And you wish them well. And you wish them out of your life. And you move on. And you keep going. And you work on you. So, yeah, dark triads, yeah, they're harmful. They're terrible. They're awful. And Jesus, criminy, I wouldn't want to live in their heads for two seconds. It must suck, really, to be them with no joy, no light, no light, no fun, no helping other people really, no compassion, no self-compassion, no compassion for others. That is my definition of hell, is to be a dark triad because there's no joy. There's no true love, true light, true happiness, true health. There's none of that. It's all just this black mass of control and manipulation and me, 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 I, 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 more. That's no way to live. That's a horrible way to live. I have great compassion for that. That sucks. I would not want to be in their heads. It's awful. 
Do I like them? No. Am I going to allow them in my life? No. And am I going to call them out if they're doing stuff that's harming another person? You bet your sweet ass I am. But I also understand they're suffering. They're suffering. There it is. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I found unconditional love for myself and forgiving myself helped me understand that I choose what I feel. Yes. So I believe I'm not the only one needing this. Yeah. Unconditional love for ourselves. Absolutely. And for other people. And that's really what it is. But that does not mean idiot compassion. This is where people get confused. They're like, oh, if you love somebody unconditionally, you let them do whatever. Uh-uh. Wrong. You can love them from afar. If they're abusive, you can say, okay, I wish you well, and I wish you out of my life. Okay, there you go. Have a nice life. Go bye-bye. You know, that whole thing. Um, but you understand unconditional love is you love yourself, and you love other people, and you do not wish them harm, and you don't do anything to harm them period. Somebody was asking me about the smear campaign. They were like, well, what's the difference between, you know, being harmed and doing a smear campaign? Well, when an abuser has abused and the, the target of abuse speaks out and speaks the truth, the abuser will accuse the target of abuse of smearing. That's different. So a smear campaign is when somebody takes to social media takes to, you know, total strangers and just, you know, smears the person, told, tells total lies and, and exaggerates and this, that, and the other thing. The truth is when you go to your therapist, you say, I'm being abused, or you go to your family and friends, I'm being abused, this is what's happening. There's a big difference. There's no exaggeration. There's no, you know, intentionally trying to harm the person's um, reputation. Does that make sense? So um, smear campaigns are conducted by abusers, period. So there that is. Um, okay. I have been following your videos for several months and it's really helped me see a direction for healing. Good. I'm glad I could help. Um, okay. So I think I have recapped everything that I need to recap. Next week, we are going to talk about goal setting. So we talked a little bit uh, on uh, December 31st about your New Year's resolutions. I want to talk about how to keep that going. So now that you're moving out of the relationships, now that you're getting past the abuse or you're working through the abuse, I want you to start setting goals. What are your goals? What do you want to do? What did the abuser keep you from doing that you want to do? So we're going to talk about goal setting and we're going to talk about not self-sabotaging, how to take those baby steps to get from point A to point B, because that's all I care about. We're not going to go point A to point Z. We're going to go point A to point B. So next week, I'm going to talk about goal setting and how to keep moving forward, how to not self-sabotage. Um, I hope this answered all of your questions on the sexual abuse. If you guys have questions, okay, you can reach me on Facebook. I'm on We Need to Talk with Chris Godinez there on Facebook. You can IM me there. But here's the thing, guys. I'm getting novels. Don't send me novels. I don't have time. I've got a full load at work. And so if you just keep it short, just really, I don't need the whole background because trust me, abuse is abuse is abuse is abuse. It's all the same no matter where it is in the world. The behavior is the same. Like there's the abuse players playbook. Seriously. So just send me your question. Okay. <laughs> I don't need the backstory. So um, you can send questions there. Um, I do have my shows planned out through, I think, about June. But if you send me questions that you want me to talk about, what I'll try to do is I'll try to write down all of the questions. And then when I get a chance in the middle of the week, I'll do like one of those one-hour little videos like I've been doing when I get a whole bunch of questions and I'll try to answer them all. So somebody, somebody had questions on, you know, how the abusers uh, infantilize the uh, abuse victim. And I want to talk about that in another video. Um, so send me the questions that you want me to answer. I'll try to find time during the week to do a quick little, you know, hour long thing and answer those questions. Keep your questions short. You can get to me on, um, we need to talk with Chris Godinas on Facebook. You can instant message me on uh, YouTube or not instant message. You can message me on YouTube. You can instant message me on Facebook. Um, I also have my LPC Chris Godinas page, and that's where I try to connect a little more personally. I'll put jokes up there. I'll put you know my political stuff up there and things like that. Uh, the AHA counseling page is for my clients, um, but I also post a whole bunch of Psychology Today uh, articles on there. So if you're interested in seeing the Psychology Today articles, go there. Um, cannot think of anything else, guys. I, uh, my voice is starting to go, so I am going to peace out. Have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye.